Hi, everybody. Today I would like to talk about something that is often omitted in economic models, namely transaction costs. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I can convince you that from now on we shouldn't do this for a multiple of reasons. First of all, transaction costs are both interesting and frustrating, at least for me, whenever I see an additional cost on Uber Eats or when I book an Airbnb. But on the other hand, because I will also hopefully convince you that there are some deep insights to be gained when we look at transaction costs. Um, yeah, this is joint work with my two supervisors, uh, Heinrich and Barry, together with Marek from the University of Zurich. So um, let's start with some economics 101. What we actually look at when we talk about markets is one of the simplest economics model that is basically as old as economic theory itself, namely that of a two-sided commodity market. That is, you have buyers and sellers who want to buy or sell one unit of an indivisible good. Now, what happens in finite markets, the mechanism behind it, is that of a double auction clearinghouse. Basically, buyers and sellers submit bids and asks in order to obtain the item to a central market maker, who then draws this very basic picture of demand and supply, and chooses a market clearing price where the two intersect, and then all buyers who are above the market price trade with all sellers who are below the market price at exactly this price. So the question is, why is the setting of double auctions interesting? Well, first of all, they are commonly used in practice. For example, the opening prices at the New York Stock Exchange are determined by a double auction. But moreover, they are also interesting from a strategic point of view. And there has been done a lot of analysis on this over the last 50 years. And the main insight is that double auctions, as common as they are, they are not strategy proof. Why? Because there are always two traders who have incentive to lower or uh, or elevate their bid or ask in order to influence the market price in their favor. So again, a lot of work. Just one quote from a famous paper by Rustikini is that they really characterize this as the essence of bargaining, so deviations from truthfulness in order to influence the market price. But why do we still find double auctions in practice? Well, there are these famous results that with a growing market size, this actually goes away because in a very large market, a single trader cannot influence demand and supply anymore, so truthfulness and associated efficiency emerges. So this is basically the starting point that we're going to look at, and we want to see if transaction costs actually mess with this very famous result. So I will hopefully convince you in a second with a few examples that there is almost no trade in today's economy without transaction costs. Yet, surprisingly, these costs have often been omitted in the strategic analysis of markets. There are some notable exceptions, but they all focus on some very niche cases and very specific transaction costs and not ask the overall question that I will show you in a second. But first, let me tell you about three examples. The first one is something that is often thought about when you think about external factors like handling fees like packaging or shipping costs. Handling fees, for example, eBay charges 50 cents per transaction no matter what the transaction is. And packaging or shipping costs are almost omnipresent in every day today. Now, second part is often thought of as inherently tied to market makers or online marketplaces. That is, transaction costs in form of price fees. You can find this in art auctions for auction houses. eBay also charges price fees for different classes of items. Airbnb has a 12.4% uh, service fee, but also stamp duties or taxes can be thought of as price fees. Now, a third class of fees is something that's often not recognized because they are charged inherently, and those are spread fees. Those are often accompanied by uh, intermediaries because, for example, sales representatives get charged a fee not only on the volume, but also on how well they trade an item. So a spread fee is basically a percentage between the action of a trader and the market price. So if a trader acts well and submits an action close to the market price, they will pay less fee. You can find this also in bid-ask spreads at the stock market, and you can also think about well-known auctions like first price auctions as a second price auction plus a 100% spread fee. So the question that we want to address with this paper is, how do these transaction costs alter exactly these classical results of large markets? How do they alter the strategic behavior? Do we still find truthfulness? And how do transaction costs alter or maybe even mess with the welfare properties of such markets? But let's start with a very crude market model and let's meet the traders we will interact with. So the market, as I already mentioned, is instead of a uh, two-sided commodity market. So we have traders who are interested in buying or selling an item. And we will treat both cases simultaneously of both finite markets with M buyers and N sellers, as well as a non-atomic, as well as a setting with non-atomic continuum of traders. So now, as is usual with auctions, every trader has an inherent private type 
or valuation of the item. For a buyer, this could be how much they are willing to pay for the item, and for a seller, this could be the production cost, the, pri the minimum price that they want in order to uh, sell the item. And we assume that these types are just drawn from two uh, probability distributions in an independent way for buyers and sellers. In finite markets and in infinite markets, we assume that the types are distributed according to measures who follow exactly the same densities. Now, given their types, traders must submit an action to the market maker, and these actions correspond to bids or asks. For a buyer, this is basically a signal of their maximum willingness to pay. So I'm willing to accept any market price below it, but I'm not willing to trade for a market price above it. And for a seller, it's an ask, it's completely the other way around. Now, when a private information setting, so a trader knows their own type, but they don't know, and their own bid, but they don't know what actions the others submit. So we assume that traders have beliefs about what what actions the other traders will submit. And the trader model this, models this again by the assumption of IID random variables, one for buyers and one for sellers. Now, the setting that you may be familiar with is that of a Bayesian-Nash equilibrium in this sense, which assumes that a trader knows the type distributions and then knows what strategies the other players will assume. And our setting of beliefs incorporates this, but we simply allow for a more heterogeneous class of beliefs that might be completely wrong. Now, how is trade facilitated? In order to obtain an item, a buyer will make some payment and a seller will receive some payment in order to get rid of their item. And we assume that if traders are involved in trade, the utility is simply the difference. Because for a buyer, he values the item at a value of TB, but he has to make a payment and we simply assume that the utility for the buyer is the difference between those two. So this is a risk-neutral trader. And if they are not involved in trade, we assume that they have zero utility. So now, as I already mentioned, we look at double auctions. There's a nice book by Friedman about it. And in finite markets, we will use a mechanism by Rustichini. And in an accompanying paper, we have extended this to the limit market, where basically, given all actions, the market maker draws this demand and supply curve and then chooses a market price which equilibrates the two. And then he selects all buyers with a bid above and all sellers with an ask below that. And if there are ties, we'll do a uniform fair lottery, but for this talk, uh, let's omit this mathematical detail. Now, without transaction costs, trade happens that all buyers pay the market price and all sellers receive the market price. So the novelty of our work is that we introduce those transaction costs. So additional to the market price, each buyer pays in transaction cost 5B, and again, also each seller pays a transaction cost phi s, so this, uh, the payment that the seller receives will be the difference between the market price and the transaction cost. And for analytical tractability, we will assume that the payments are continuous in the action of a trader and also weakly increasing. Why weakly increasing? This is in order to mimic the behavior without transaction costs because higher actions lead to a higher payment. So what is the incentive for a buyer? A buyer wants to pay less. So a more aggressive action for a buyer is to actually offer less in order to decrease their payment. And in the same sense, a seller wants to submit a higher, pay, uh, a higher ask in order to drive up their payment and to receive more. And now the three canonical examples that I already mentioned are that of a constant fee. So no matter what the actions are, you simply pay a constant CI. That of a price fee, this is you pay a fixed percentage of the market price that is chosen given all the actions. And the last one is that of a spread fee. So here's the spread for a buyer. The spread is the difference between the action of a buyer and the market price. And the spread fee simply is the difference between those two. A 100% spread fee would be a name your own price double auction where every buyer pays what they bid and every seller pays what they receive. So those are the three examples, but we will look in our analysis at a much more general class of transaction costs. But now we come to the important question of the incentives, of how actually, what should a trader do in order to maximize their expected utility? And I will argue that there are three different incentives. The first one is related to truthfulness. That is, traders don't want to uh, make a loss with their trades. So without transaction costs, the classical notion of truthfulness is that of bidding your own gross valuation, so your type. Why? Because that has some nice properties. The first one is, if you submit truthfully a type, this will never result in a loss because if you think of a buyer, if they submit their type, they will only be involved in trade if the market price is below it and the utility is the difference, so you never end up with a trade that makes you a loss. And you also have an undominated property in the sense that a buyer should never submit something above his valuation because the only trades that he can gain from that are ones where the market price is too high, so we'll end up with a loss. But it is also not dominated by something lower, because as soon as he adds strategic, he might lose out on some uh, profitable deals. 
Now, the main point here on this slide is that this notion of truthfulness does not work anymore when you have transaction costs. Because think, for example, the simplest example of a constant transaction cost, if a buyer trades at the market price, his utility from the market price alone is already at zero. So if he now has to pay an additional transaction cost, he ends up making a loss. And that's something that a buyer don't want. So we adapt the notion of truthfulness by adjusting the gross value to a net value as being for a buyer the small or the highest and for a seller the smallest uh, action that satisfy the property that you never make a loss and that is not dominated by a larger action. So we use the properties to extend it and we say that the trader is not truthful if they report the net value. And I will show three examples of the net value in a minute in order to make it a little more tangible. So we have some nice analytic lemma and the intuition behind the net value is basically a safety net in the sense of it is the least aggressive action with which you never make a loss. And the worst thing that can happen for a trader is that he trades exactly where the market price is equal to his own action and this is exactly what this formula shows. So the net value is the value that given trade at the market price, you end up with zero utility. So for a constant fee, as you might have guessed already, this is just an easy additive shift of the true valuation because you have to account for a constant fee. For a price fee, this now corresponds to a multiplicative shift, that is, uh, traders with higher valuations have to take it into account more in order to, such that if this value is equal to the market price, they end up with zero utility in this case. And the interesting case here is also the spread fee. The spread fee is the only kind of transaction cost where you can't be completely truthful because in the worst case scenario where you trade at the market price, well, the spread is equal to zero, so the spread fee is equal to zero, so you don't have to pay any transaction cost and you can't be completely truthful. So this is the first incentive. Now, the second incentive is involved to, well, traders actually want to be involved in trade. When is a trader involved in trade? A buyer is involved in trade if he bids above the market price, and the seller is involved in trade if they bid below the market price. And we find out that a certain threshold will be of critical, uh, will be of critical importance when we analyze that. And this is this critical value, which is basically the market price in an infinite market where demand and supply is drawn, uh, is simply given by the beliefs of, uh, by the action beliefs of a trader. And what we find in large markets is that trade actually becomes predictable because this trading probability actually converges to a zero one step function. That is because in large markets, the, uh, probab the probability goes away and a trader will be involved in trade as long as they submit something that is above the critical value. So now coming to the last incentives, traders actually want to be involved in good trades. So what does that mean? They want, to, uh, they want to influence the market price and they want to influence their fee. Now the famous finding is that influencing the market price, you cannot do that anymore in large markets. And now the main thing is that we characterize transaction costs by whether or not they have the same property. So we say that the transaction cost is influenceable if you can still influence it in large markets. So if you have a non-vanishing influence by lowering your action, you can actually lower your transaction cost. And this is a spread fee because, as you recall, a spread fee is dependent on the market price and your action. And by switching your action, you can directly diminish your fee. And the second one is an asymptotically uninfluenceable fee. Those are price or constant fees. Well, constant fees are just by nature uninfluenceable. And by the statement above, you cannot influence the market price, so you can also not influence uh, a price fee anymore. So now coming to the optimal behavior, and I need to speed up a little bit. Optimal behavior is simply just maximizing the expected utility. So you have those two, impos uh, those two opposing incentives of maximizing the probability of trade versus maximizing the profitability of trade. And here we find that two completely opposing behavior emerge because for influenceable transaction costs, profitability of trade outweighs probability of trade. So we find that something like price guessing is optimal. So traders actually don't become truthful, but they try to estimate what the market price is and try to bid very close to it in order to minimize their transaction cost. And for asymptotically uninfluenceable fees, we basically recover the classical results from the literature, namely that truthfulness is an epsilon best response, and best responses are also close to epsilon truthfulness, because if you cannot influence your transaction costs and your payment, the best thing you can do is be involved in as much trade as possible, and so you become truthful. So this separation of transaction costs into two different classes shows that really two completely diametrically opposed strategic behavior emerge, namely price guessing for the one side and truthfulness for the other side. And we also have some numerical examples, which I skip for the moment, but let's look through the eyes of the market maker now. How does these strategic incentives and those, uh, 
optimal responses that we found actually influence welfare properties of market. And when I talk about welfare properties of markets, what is the welfare? The welfare is these gains of trade, which in the classical microeconomic setting is this, in, uh, is this uh, area below demand and supply curve, which corresponds to the uh, integral over the utility of all traders who are involved in trade. And now you can actually split up the gains of trade into three different categories if strategic behavior is involved. As soon as agents become more aggressive, not all trade happens, so you will lose some area of trade, and this is loss. This is now due because not all traders will trade anymore. And the, uh, if you have transaction costs, well, what you actually have is that you can split it up into revenue because now you have transaction costs, and the remaining utility is now the surplus that remains for the traders. So look at, looking at a stylized example for price and spread fees, if we have a uniform market with types in one, two, we can actually characterize those for price fees very well if we look at this decomposition as a function of the market price. Because for zero fees, what we find is that traders can be completely truthful, so all of the surplus remains. But as soon as you ramp up a price fee, well, traders have to account for the fee in order to not make a loss. So, well, you lose some efficiency and the loss increases, but also you now make some revenue in order from the transaction costs, so the loss is increasing with the fee size, and the revenue is actually a non-trivial optimization problem because if you increase the fee size, you make more from individual trades, but, well, you will lose more and more trades, so there is an optimal point in order to uh, maximize the revenue, but if I have time, I will talk about that in a second. So this truthfulness is independent of beliefs and uncertainty, so this one picture really characterizes the market metrics for price fees perfectly. Now, the point is that the same thing is not true for spread fees. Why? Because here we have the optimal behavior of price guessing. And price guessing crucially depends on the beliefs of the traders. So now here for this example, we simply look at a setting where buyers and sellers believe that the market price is equal to some value beta and sigma in the interval. Remember, the true market price would be 1.5 in our uniform setting. But what we find here is that now we have a lot of different uh, scenarios that we have to cover given to the different beliefs. If traders have uh, the correct beliefs, namely the belief that market price is 1.5, the market will be fully efficient, but there will be no revenue because all traders completely estimated the market price, meaning that no spread is there to be charged. The second scenario is that of a homogeneous bias, where all traders still coordinate around the same market price, but well, this market price is a little off, so there is some additional efficiency loss and still no revenue to be gained. And just skipping the third part for an aggressive bias, if both buyers and sellers believe in a market price that is on the wrong side of the true one, they completely miss each other and this might result in complete market failure. So the takeaway message is that market outcomes can range here now from full efficiency to complete market failure, given the beliefs of the traders. And we also test for aggregate uncertainty, but in order to get to the last part, I will skip that. And now we'll actually look at revenue maximization in a very quick way. We can show that for an influenceable one, you can always decompose it into something of an uninfluenceable one, because influenceable could also be spread plus constant. And what we find is that well, with this decomposition, a purely influenceable transaction cost, like a spread fee, where you can be completely truthful, will always lead to zero revenue to, due to price guessing. So we can look only at how uninfluenceable costs uh, influence the revenue. And I will just show this very quickly. We can do this in an optimal way. The revenue will always be equal to some rectangle under the demand and supply curve. So it won't depend on the fee that you charge. So you can make actually with the second point, by a perfect scaling, you can actually find that any uninfluenceable transaction cost, no matter if it's constant or price, can be charged in order to extract the perfect revenue. So just in one sentence, influenceable transaction costs will give to zero uh, revenue if the market has perfect information, and in the other sense, you can optimize revenue. I will skip the beyond auctions because I think I'm already a little close on time. We can actually extend all of our findings beyond double auctions and they still hold valid. And the take home message now is that the transaction costs can fundamentally alter the incentives and the welfare properties of markets. So for influenceable ones, you find price guessing. The efficiency depends on the beliefs about the market. It is not robust to misbeliefs and the revenue is always zero. And for uninfluenceable ones, the classical finding of truthfulness is still optimal. The market is partially efficient because you will always lose something due to fee constraints, but it is robust against misbeliefs, and you can actually tweak uh, uninfluenceable transaction costs in order to make them revenue optimal. So, yeah, thank you.
a little bit over time, but maybe we have time for one question. And that, yeah, you can already set up. Yep. Oh. Uh, you can speak from here. Oh, so um, it seems like I think you on slide seven that uh, we should have like the top of the revenue curve. You might get that has like an enormous amount of loss. Curve. Like I think we're in a third with with still like the loss. So it seems like there's some pretty serious welfare losses. In this case, it's even 50%. Oh, you can't see it anymore, but at the optimal transaction cost, 50% is revenue, 50% is surplus, and 25% uh, is surplus, and 25% is loss, yeah. In this classical setting, no, because we can actually show that if you want to be revenue optimal, you will always have the same trading volume, which always leads to the same loss. So if you're a market maker who not only cares about revenue, but also about surplus, then you might not want to optimize revenue, but some utility function depending on revenue and surplus. And then you might find a different uh, transaction cost to be optimal with a lower percentage, perhaps. But yeah, this is work that we want to do in the future.